Um, so, oh, there goes our sea level. <laughs> 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 uh, so there's, there, there's, a, there's a few things that we'd like to present today, but more, more than anything else, this is going to be a technical presentation um, on the technology that we're using to support federation and also the technology that we're using to support desktops and identity. But before we do that, we just wanted to define the characterization virtual laboratory for those who don't have necessarily the background. Um, fundamentally, it is a program of work of the characterization virtual laboratory, which is a program of work to connect Australian characterization instruments with data management environments, tools, and analysis pipelines on the Australian research program. The achievements of the program today are that we've connected over 100 Australian instruments, many of them funded by NCRIS, um, of a significant value um, to Australian researchers, both financial and in the data that they produce. And um, we've had over 2,700 users of either the CDL or the software that we've developed under the CDL, because a lot of the software that we develop is reused across um, HPC facilities in Australia and internationally. <coughs> From the researcher's point of view, it's really just a place where a researcher can access their characterization data and many of the softwares and tools that they might need to, to process and analyze that data. Um, the Sea Devil itself is doing a number of things. It's connecting instruments, it's continuing to create rich online environments and it's undertaking a training and fair data program as well. The part that we're going to talk about specifically today is the rich online environments, and it's really just one segment of what we do, um, but we can't necessarily present the entire technology stack of all of the program. And one of the things that we'll focus on is the federation of the characterization VL across multiple nodes. So the characterization VL desktop is the desktop environment that we provide to our, our research user community. Um, largely, it's been run across two nodes, um, an instance on the Nectar Cloud and an instance on Massive, and we're now federating that out so that it's run across a significantly larger cohort of, of nodes. Um, and so the nodes that we're, we're developing and deploying under this in a sort of prototype fashion uh, at UWA on the Pawsey Research Cloud, at um, UQ as well, and a prototype in Sydney of the of a Windows CDL instance, and also deploying some software at University of Wollongong, um, which is part of the CDL as well. Um, it's it's important to actually understand that many of the instances here are actually quite different. And, and different partners in the project require different <coughs> things. So we have gone through a bit of a process to try to work out what federation and what CVL nodes across Australia might look like. As an example, UQ wants to integrate with an existing partner form computer, whereas UWA, the instance there, will be an instance very similar to what we run at Monash, and it will run basically from source. So they're very different instances. But what we have done is we've developed a set of federation principles that um, are consistent across the entire network of CDL nodes, or that will be consistent across the entire network. Um, and basically, this is what it means to be a CDL node. It's a single user portal, a single sign-up and registration mechanism through AAF, single help desk, a single shared software stack in as much as is possible considering the technical and licensing challenges, and a single desktop user interface and UI branding, menus, background, software module, this <coughs> sort of thing. In a sense, what we're saying is the consistent user experience across all of the deployments that we're undertaking. Um, there's a number of things that aren't in scope just yet, such as the, the ability to capture data at a number of instru in instruments that's inconsistent, and it probably should be because all in instruments are different. Um, and so there's different technology stacks that we're deploying, and it's largely these two architectures here. One is to deploy from source on OpenStack, 
using our uh, really our, our scripts, but our Ansible scripts um, that we we use to deploy Cluster, and Chris will talk about that. And the other one is to integrate with an existing high performance computing system and basically provide a new layer over the top, which makes that system consistent with the CPL model. So I won't go into this in, in too much detail because we don't have a lot of time, but those are the two models, the two technical models that they're deploying. From there, over to Chris. All right. Um, so please stop me if I get too excited. I'm actually quite pleased with the technology stack we've developed for doing all this stuff because for me, it's actually really simple, basic bits of technology that we've hung together to make something really useful. So, as I'm presenting this, you might find I'm a little bit dismissive of there's not much to see here, but on the other hand, it's actually really cool the way these bits came together. Now, as Wojtek mentioned, part of what we've got is a technology stack for deploying what amounts to a cluster. And it might not be a really high performance cluster, but it's a cluster nonetheless. You have a head node, you have a set of batch nodes that you can schedule to, you have a shared file system. And we based all of this around OpenStack because it was free and that did a wonderful job of putting it in front of us. Ansible and Git. Now, I'm going to talk about that first and a little bit after that I'll talk about the, um, the desktop delivery technology stuff that actually faces the user. Now, Ansible, if you don't know it, um, it's a configuration management tool, much like Puppet and Chef, but it's in Python. Um, you define your configuration and you let Ansible get it there. So you, you define the end state that you want to be in. We end up using this for almost everything. You can see Lance's provided us a lovely example here of probing all the nodes in a class to find out the uptime. So it actually replaces tools like PDSH as well if you wanted to. And it's dumb as bricks. It's, it's basically wrapping SSH. Anything you can do with SSH, you can do with Ansible, but it lays on a little bit of Python glue and it means you can write out, rather than writing a shell script to execute for SSH, you write a YAML file defining what you want. It's got loads of support around the world so you can hang together ideas from other people. Now, salt would have been just as good. Honestly, there's nothing special about Ansible. Move along. If you want to learn Ansible, I think that's great. Um, and I think it's one of those things that you learn by doing, to be honest. The other really important part is Git. Now, we've got a slightly weird Git set up with our, our definition of a cluster because we've actually found that there's loads of bits that are common to every cluster I've ever touched because I think they're a good idea. And I, I think most people are familiar with these. Most people know that if you're going to run a cluster, you're probably going to put LDAP on it. If you're going to run a cluster, you're probably going to make an NFS client to connect to use a local to get your software off. So we've tried to separate all of our Ansible components into stuff which can get reused and stuff which is the discrete variables which vary between the clusters and most importantly, passwords. As a result, we've got effectively two Git repositories, one of which we're completely open and anyone can go and have a look at. And the other which has all our passwords in it and we would be horrified if that ever got out to anybody else. And we actually have a different password-based um, repository, a different repository for each of the clusters we run. Now, we do use Git submodules, and this gets confusing as heck for most people, because Git defines this as a mechanism for bringing in the dependencies. So it's actually really useful to say, we've got this set of roles that are common things we do on all of our clusters, and each cluster depends on that. And it allows you to do this sort of QA where the, the, the upstream roles, the most recent version might change, but you might not have QA that as being ready for your cluster. But for anybody who's used Git, they know that Git's confusing enough on its own, and now I'm telling you that you've got a second Git commit in there, and you have to make sure which one you're committing and updating to keep everything in sync. So it takes a little bit of a learning curve, even for highly technical people to get over it, but it is the exact solution that you want for this scenario where you've got a shared piece of code and a non-shared piece of code. Um, a really important component is also how we make changes. We follow a very standard um, software developer principle in that one person's going to actually do the work 
and submit a request and another person is going to review it. At that point, we base, we're a little bit uh, free and easy in that anyone can go ahead and deploy it. We don't have a big CI button for our clusters because it turns out it's really hard to figure out what on earth a unit test is for a compute service. Um, but at that point, we can go ahead and break it. And we have one rule. If you make a mistake that the users notice, you bring in a cake to apologize for your mistake. Um, and I actually have a little bit of documentation up there at isocake.readthedocs. I encourage everyone to support this as a principle of self-improvement. It really leads you trying hard not to break things when you know the penalty is apologizing to everyone by baking. So that's how we build our clusters really easily. The other really interesting bit of, in, in my opinion, of what we do is this trick of federating across Linux-based POSIX systems. Um, for anyone who's been around the traps for a few years, will know that there's been multiple attempts within the Australian community to say, hey, let's all have one Linux username. Let's have one password even, so that all of our Rajan accounts are the same as our Pawsey accounts and the same as our Massive accounts, and you can log in anywhere and you don't have to remember a buttload of passwords. Um, this is really nice. It would be lovely to be able to authenticate once and access more clusters or even just have the uh, identical authentication keys. But it turns out nobody wants to really sign up on this. There's a lot of technical work and political work necessary to be able to make that happen. So we actually decided to work around it. Now we have gone, I've got the point here that our clusters, we try to give them identical environments to try to make sure our software is installed everywhere. And one of the things we're leveraging at that, for that at the moment is singularity containers. We're finding this is a really awesome technology for effectively non-root privileges on the same things which Docker does. Um, the nuts and bolts end for our federation when you access a desktop through the web browser, what happens is the, the application, which is all, actually in this case it's Java and Angular JS, the application goes and asks for access to a cluster. You then log in via AAF, and because all our clusters do have different usernames, we've configured it so the AAF service has to look up your username for a given cluster. You then, in your web browser, still provide an OAuth 2 permission to allow the Strudel Web web service to access the cluster on your behalf. And that web service never sees your password for the cluster and only gets a short lived credential, which is going to expire after a while. So, this is my way of saying, really, you can trust this guy. You haven't told us your password, and I'm going to lose access in an hour or so when the credential expires anyway. This is really one of the ways that we're trying to get buy-in from everyone and a really low barrier to entry from the, the security perspective to say, look, it's a secure service. You don't have to do a full year-long audit to figure out this is going to be okay. Um, we really felt that was important for getting buy-in for building out the federation is to allow each cluster to keep control of their usernames and groups, each service provider to keep control of their usernames and groups, and to guarantee that just because you signed up to the CDL and we've perhaps given you resources on M3 to, to be able to do some basic CDL work, you don't necessarily have resources to do work in any other part of the country on any other cluster. That's up to you talking to those cluster administrators to ask for resources. Now in the future, we might get enough political buy-in to be able to say, yes, you signed up for CDL, you are clearly an Australian characterization researcher, you can get to use it anywhere. Um, and our next generation of federation, I'm actually thinking about and developing this right now, we're actually aiming to have our web application ask for access to all of the clusters at once, and we'll poll around and see which clusters you're able to access. The result of this is hopefully in our new web UI we'll have a little option to copy between Massive and CDL at EWA or copy between Massive and Rajan. There won't be any extra passwords to enter into. We've already got the short-lived credentials, we'll just make that happen for you. So that's our technology stack. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.